Now, if you would take your copy of Scripture and turn to the New Testament epistle of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read the whole chapter, so it's a little bit longer reading than what we would normally do, but Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, reading through the end of verse 22. I don't know that we're going to be able to cover all of these in the sermon, but we want to look at this at this time. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at this time, that time, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him... We both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you who are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you who you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray together. Now, fathers, we come to this text. I pray, Lord, that you would give us here to, ears to hear and give us a, a mind to think through this. May we come to understand what you're saying through these words to us. And may we find application for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning I want us to begin a new sermon series. Uh, We're going to address for the next several weeks what it is to gather. That is, what it is to gather as God's people. What is the gathering? How do we understand the gathering of God's people? And this text that we just read is going to be a launching point for us this morning to begin to think about this. Because what we want to do, we want to make a connection between how the congregation understands itself as a church. That is, how you and I, as the congregation known as Believers Baptist Church, how we understand ourselves as the church and then connect that to the worship that we do as a church. So we want to understand what it is to be the church and then connect that to what it is to worship as the church. 
So we will look at um, this text that it, we have before us. We'll look at some other texts in the future. But I think this will set the stage for us. Because what we need to understand better is what worship is. What worship is. And I know there's a lot of thoughts and ideas about what it is. A lot of it has to do with consumer mentality, consumer thought. A lot of it has to do with what the popular thinking about the church and how we ought to reach people is. A lot of it has to do with emotions. A lot of it has to do with feelings and thoughts about entertainment. So there's a lot of different ways that people think about worship. I think the psalmist says in Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2, that it is, that is, worship is, very briefly, very simply, giving glory unto God's name as God's people gather in one location. Giving glory to God's name. Giving him the due glory his name deserves. So then what do we do in corporate worship? How do we do that? What is the aim of corporate worship? What is the point of our gathering? Is it important that we gather? Must we gather? Is it important that we do that? And why are the reasons? And too often I believe that our gathering together becomes something like a habit to us. Uh, it's something that we socially do. Uh, it eases our conscience. It causes us to feel good about our life. It, it, it feeds our self-righteousness. It feeds our religious thoughts and ideas. And so the gathering is much more than that, as you might gather from your previous study of Scripture, your previous understanding of Scripture. But it's a privilege to be able to gather with God's people to worship Him as Kyle read earlier from John chapter 4 in spirit and in truth. God is looking for worshipers. That is, by the way, the reason that you and I are created. In fact, if you'll turn with me back one chapter in this book of Ephesians, I want you to see some of what's being said about those who are God's people and what their purpose is. Look with me. They're beginning at the end of verse 4. Let's just go to verse 4, the beginning of verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. This is what I want us to focus on. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of his glory and his grace. Look with me down in verse 12. <clears throat> so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. Now look at verse 14. Who is the guarantee? That is talking about the Holy Spirit. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? I think Paul is trying to say to those who are in Christ that we gather to the praise of his glory. It's not so that we can ease our conscience. It's not so that we might feel good about ourselves. It's not so that we can somehow check the box and we've accomplished our spiritual duty for that week. It's much bigger than that. It's much more important. In fact, it's so important that when you and I do not gather with God's people, we hurt ourselves spiritually. We hurt ourselves spiritually. We cause a decline in our spiritual life if we continue to not meet together. And perhaps I'm preaching to the crowd this morning as the saying would go. But I'm glad that you're here. And I think it's important 
that we hear this, especially in the culture that we find ourselves in now. The political climate, the spiritual or religious climate, the fact that churches have for a year since March of 2020, many have not even opened. They're still doing church through um, live feed. And I'm not being critical of that. I'm just saying that there ought to be caution with doing that. Because that cannot replace what we're doing this morning. So we have to continue to think rightly about the church. Why do we gather? It is important that we look at what God's word says to us about this. And so the first question that we want to consider this morning is who gathers for worship? Who gathers for worship? I mean, we gather so that we might edify one another, that we might build one another up. In fact, there are several words that are used in Scripture that speak to what it is to gather. Um, words like assembly or congregation. And all these words would mean the same to us. And it is important as we understand this particular aspect of worship. Now, think with me. Think with me, all of our life as believers is worship. Romans 12, 1 and 2 teaches us that. But this gathering together is what part of living your whole life in worship is. It's part of what it is. And I know that we can talk about family worship, we can talk about private worship, uh, we can talk about, as I said, worship of life. But I want to particularly focus on the gathering. What do we do? How do we do it? What are its purposes? And particularly this morning, who is it that gathers? Now, we understand that there are exceptions for gathering. There are medical exceptions. Sometimes people have work obligations. Sometimes there are medical crises. Um, Sometimes there's a pandemic. So I'm, I'm not saying that someone is in sin all the time when they don't gather. But I am suggesting to you that those who have the ability and do not gather with God's people harm themselves spiritually. And so it would behoove all of them and us to think rightly about this, think biblically about this as best as I can communicate it for us to understand. So let's think about these verses that we read, that is in Ephesians chapter 2, and without going as we would normally go, verse by verse, the word by word, I'm just going to have to give you some of the major statements and points of the text, and then make our way all the way through to what I want to say about the gathering. So understand, there's much to be said in these verses that is left unsaid because of the nature of our topic. If you're using your bulletin, you can follow along. There's some sermon notes there, and perhaps it would be helpful for you. But looking down with me in verse 1 of chapter 2, here it is. Here's the answer of who gathers and how that is connected to how we do things that are biblical and right in the gathering. Verse 1, you were dead in the trespasses and sins. This is Paul writing to the Gentile Ephesian believers. This is what you were. Now, they are no longer that because verse 4, by the mercy of God, they have been changed. But this is what not only these Ephesian Gentile believers were, but it's also what every person who has ever lived is before conversion. This describes every man, every woman, every person who's ever lived. They are born dead in their trespasses and sin. They are physically alive. They can breathe. They can walk. They can talk. They can think. They can rationalize. But they are spiritually dead. They cannot commend themselves to God in any way. They are indifferent toward God. They are blind spiritually. They have no spiritual life in and of themselves. 
They are unable to have any kind of spiritual relationship with God because they are dead. They are dead in their sins. They are dead in their trespasses. Trespasses meaning a idea, the idea of crossing over the line. You've crossed the line. Sins mean the idea meaning you've missed the mark. You are dead in those things. Yes, you are an innocent little infant. You have not activated sin, but you are still a sinner. By nature, you are still a sinner. And so look, you are dead in your trespasses and sin, and which, verse 2, which you, that is these Ephesian believers, and all subsequent, all people who have lived, in which you once walked, that is, the pattern of your life was this. You followed the course of this world. You followed the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of dis disobedience. In other words, look, not only were you dead in your trespasses and sin, but also you were enslaved to the plans, the patterns, the priorities of this world. You gave yourself to those things. You lived in those things, and those plans and priorities, ideas, thoughts, philosophies of the world were of the prince of the power of the air, the, the very one that we read about in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent who deceived Adam and Eve, the evil one. And as a result, you are then categorized as a son of, or a daughter of disobedience. That's all you can be. You're dead in your trespasses and sin. You walked, you lived in a pattern of the course of this world, and you followed the evil one. You were enslaved to these things. You became a son of disobedience. So verse 3, among whom we all, Paul includes himself, we all, Jews, Gentiles, Paul, Jason Rowland, all, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. And we lived according to the desires of the body and the mind. We determined to do what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. Now, it all actuated itself in different degrees and in different ways, different ages, different circumstances, different events, different lives. But this is what we were, living in the passions and the desires of our flesh. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a baby not to lie. Why? Because it's their nature. You have to teach children to, to, to tell the truth. You have to teach them to not steal. To not be jealous. To not be prideful. To not to show off. But their heart ultimately and finally has to be changed as all of our hearts has to be changed. We have to be transformed Completely made new, made alive, because we are dead. So we carried out the desires of the body and the mind, and this is the result of that. We were by nature children of wrath. That is, we lived irrationally, we lived in the impulses of our flesh, we had no governor, uh, governing of our own behavior. Only moral governing. That is, when parents would slap our hands for saying or touching the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing or they would spank our behinds. We were children of wrath. Like all of mankind, verse 3. But look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even though we are dead in our trespasses, even though we are walking and following the course of the world and following the prince of the power of the air, even though we are sons of disobedience, even though we're living in the passions of our flesh, even though we are living as children under God's wrath, God being rich in mercy, even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
You did nothing to contribute to your salvation. It was the work of God in you to draw you out of dead, your deadness. You could not do anything. You're dead. So God had to bring you to life. God had to do the change and the work. By grace, not anything that you earned, not anything that you merited, not any way that you could commend yourself to God. He did it by grace. He raised us up with him and seated us with him, that is, with Christ in the heavenly places so that he, that is, God might show the immeasurable, the greatness, the extent of the riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why did he save us? Not because he needed us. Not because there was some empty void in him. Not because there was some lack, something insufficient in God. No, he did it to show forth the immeasurable greatness of his grace that he would save those who are dead in their trespasses and sin who have no life, who have no way to have a relationship with him. That's why he did it. He does not need us. He does not need our love. He does not need our worship. But it is good that we love him. It is good that we worship him. It is right that we do that. He would deserve it being rich in mercy with which he loved us. He uses us. He gifts us. He calls us. He teaches us. He disciplines us. <clears throat> so all these things are good. But he does not need us. But it is our honor. It is our joy to gather on a Sunday morning and to give this God praise and worship. To give him the honor and glory, the majesty that he's due in and of ourselves, what we can do. He's not lacking in glory. He's not lacking in majesty. We're not filling up something that he lacks. But it's our privilege to be able to do this. So look, doesn't that change how you think about the gathering? I mean, this is what we were this is what the Ephesian believers were. This is what we all were. And God, by his grace, because of the great mercy in his love toward us, he made us alive. We were dead, and he made us alive. That's who gathers for worship. That's who gathers for worship. Worship is not for lost people. Lost people can't worship. They have to have their lives changed. Their heart has to be transformed. So the church is not for us to do what we can to bring lost people here. It's good if they come. We want to invite them. 1 Corinthians says that it is a good thing that lost people come into a corporate worship setting. That they might see the believers worshiping God. It is good that we do that. But it's never designed for lost people to, to worship God. They can't. They can't until they're made alive. Hopefully when they come to a corporate worship setting, they are made alive by the Spirit of God. But see, the corporate gathering of God's people is for God's people. That we might praise Him, that we might honor Him, that we might get into the Word of God together, that we might use our spiritual gifts to edify and build up one another, that we might serve one another, that we might forgive one another, that we might pray for one another. And, and lost people, lost, spiritually lost people, don't have that relationship with us. We only have that with one another. And, and that can't be done apart from one another. And yes, there are times that we have to do live stream. I, I, that's fine. But ultimately, finally, everybody has to come back together because we can't be complete unless we're all here. We can't accomplish all that God intends for the gathering of God's people if you're not here. You're important. 
So who gathers for worship? It's these who have been changed by God's mercy and grace. Notice what it says in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own thing or your own doing. That is, even the faith that you have been given to believe is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is from God. And it's not the result of any works, nothing you accomplished, nothing that you have done for the saving grace that is being given to you to make you in Christ. Because look, if we could do something, what would we do? If I do something to commend myself to God, if I did something to put myself in a right stead before God, if I did something to put myself in a place of justification before God, what would I do? I would stand right here and tell you how good and great I am. I would boast. I would boast. That's why it has to be all of God. That's why it has to be His doing. So he gets the praise. He gets the glory. He gets the boast about the trophies that he is saved by grace. That he has won. He has done the work. Not us. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. One of those good works is to gather. To praise. To worship him who deserves our worship. Okay, all of that was before the notes. Let's see how much further we can go before you get really restless. In all seriousness, the preaching of God's word is so important. Uh, You know, our tendency is to to, um, divide and say music is worship and preaching, uh, we endure it. But that's not, the, that's not what the biblical pattern is. Do you recall that Ezekiel the prophet was in the valley of dead bones? And what did God tell Ezekiel to do? He didn't say sing to these bones. He didn't say lead a Bible study. He didn't say pray over these bones. He didn't say let's get emotional about these bones. He said, preach to these bones and they'll come alive. And they did. Preach. And it's not the preacher. It's not the preacher. There are many who could preach better than this. That's not the point. That's not the point at all. The word of God has the power to bring alive those who are dead. Preach the word. And so preaching and singing and praying, reading the scripture, all of these things are important. How we do worship, and we'll get to those things more in the future. Right now, we're just talking about who gathers for worship. Well, let's, let's look real quickly. Beginning there in verses um, 13 through 15. Now, wait a minute. All the notes... Number one, all believers were once spiritually dead, but God made each one alive in Christ. So if you're filling in the blanks, if you're a type A personality and you can't stand to look at that page because it has a blank on it that you didn't get filled in. I know Tamara Williams is like that. (laughs) Verses 1 through 12. It is. All believers were once spiritually dead, but God made each, made each one alive in Christ. By the way, did you notice the individual aspect of God making alive? God making alive each one and yet bringing us all together. That's the second part of this, okay? So, number two. In Christ, all national, tribal, Class and cultural divisions and distinctions are reconciled to one another. All different groups, all social standings, all social constructs, all divisions and distinctions are reconciled to one another. And Paul uses 
Jews and Gentiles to be the example of this. I can say all nationalities and tribes and languages and peoples and distinctions and social order, all those things. I can say that because of the example that Paul gives us here beginning in verse 13. Look at this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were one, were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, we, 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 we skip verses 11 and 12. So can we just go back just for a second because they're important to fill out verses 13 through 15. Therefore, because of what God has done for these Ephesian Gentile believers in Christ, and therefore all of us, therefore remember, you Gentiles, that at one time you were Gentiles as in the flesh. That's what you are as your nationality. That's how you are as your person. You were called with contempt by the Jews, the uncircumcised. Of course, circumcised being circumcision, rather, being the sign in the Old Testament for the relationship of God's people, that is the Jews, with himself. They began to believe in circumcision as being a sign of being better than, higher class, above all other peoples. And so they would contemptuously call Gentiles the uncircumcised. They would say it with a sneer. They would say it in self-righteousness. And they would say it in hate. You are nothing but uncircumcised Gentiles would be the thought. Paul says, by what is called the circumcision. You were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that is the Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands. That is, circumcision is a procedure, it's a surgery, and is made in the flesh by the hands. And Paul is reminding those Jewish readers and Jewish people who might hear these words that they are no better than the Gentiles. That they do not have a above special kind of relationship with God because they were depending on their circumcision to determine that. It was, they had not been changed in heart. Their lives had not been transformed. They were just talking about the mark in the flesh that would set them apart and set them in right stead with God. So, remember, you Gentiles, verse 12, that you were at that time, at the time of being separated from God, at the time of being called contemptuously the uncircumcision, you were separated from Christ, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, that is what we see in the Old Testament, having no hope and without God in the world. That's what you were. Now, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off, once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you see what's happening? Do you see what the power of the gospel does? It brings Jews and Gentiles together to worship in a gathering. Only the gospel could break down the dividing wall. Only the gospel could bring down the hostility. Only the gospel could break down the prejudice and the racism and the hatred and the bitterness and the jealousy. Only the gospel could bring them together, to gather in one place to worship the triune God and give him honor. Only the gospel could do that. That's who gathers for worship. No matter what your nationality is, no matter what your tribe is, no matter what your social standing is, no matter who you are, you are brought near to God and near to one another. And it's important that we gather because the gospel has done its work in us. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one, Jew and Gentile, made us one and has broken down in his flesh. That is, Jesus has broken down in his flesh 
the dividing wall of hostility. And he abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, look, one new man in place of the two, so making peace. One new man. That's why he says in another place in Galatians, there's no Jew or Gentile. Because we are one new man. We are believers in Christ. It brings us back to Genesis chapter 3. When Eve is brought before Adam. And Adam sees this beautiful woman. And God performs, if you will, the first wedding ceremony. And the commentary about that is that they have become what? One flesh. Same thing. Jew, Gentile, one flesh. Black, white, brown, Asian, Hispanic, rich, poor. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, we are brought together one in Christ. And the gathering is where that power of the gospel is displayed. Well, let's just go to the, some of the implications. Let's look at one implication for us. We're going to come back to this next week. Let's come to this same outline. Maybe different title. But let's come to that. And let's talk about the implications for what Paul is saying to us. Number one, the first implication, let's talk about that one. Um, that means that we gather as worshipers and not as consumers. If God has done the work of transforming our lives, making us one, that means when we come together, we come for the purpose of worship and we don't come to consume a product, to be sold a product. Uh, we come as a worshiper and not a consumer. You see, if we come as a consumer, here's my thinking. Uh, when we come as a consumer, we come as a, a customer. And as the old saying goes, the customer is always right. Can we do church like that? We can't do church based on the customer always being right. Church, when I say church, I mean the gathering, the worship gathering. Those synonyms get mixed up. So we can't come to church. Listen, we can't come to church as a consumer and say... Um, do you like the music? Can't some come in as a consumer and say, did I like the songs that we sang? Because what we need to ask is, did the music, did the song help me worship God? Was it biblical? Was there truth there? Did it help me in my faith to understand more of who God is? Neither can we come as a consumer and say, well, did I like the preacher? Did I like the sermon? That's the wrong question. Did the sermon help me in my spiritual life, did it help me understand who God was? Did it help me think about God? Did it help me think about my life, my sin? Did it help me spiritually? He may not be the most eloquent, the most polished, but the question is, did I like what the preacher said? Because there may be things that the preacher says that we don't like, but yet are still spiritually good for us. C.S. Lewis, in his uh, book, 
the screw tape letters has a screw tape the head demon advised one of his under demons one of his understudies to whose name by the way is Wormwood and screw tape advises Wormwood that if he can't cure a man his man his project if he can't cure his man from church going then he should aim to turn his man into a church connoisseur church taste taster and just go to what he likes because what God is looking for what the enemy in screw tapes words who is God what the enemy wants is for the man to be a pupil not a connoisseur So if we think of ourselves as consumers, if we come to the gathering as a consumer, here's another problem. Um, we come and you think, and we wrongly call this a stage. I don't know what else you call it. But we wrongly call this a stage because the mindset is, now I'm doing the performing and you're the audience. We do it all the time in all the other venues of life, don't we? Concerts and ball games and plays and nothing wrong with any of those things. I'm just saying, you know where the real action is? Right there. In the pew. God is the audience. You're not an audience and I'm not a performer. The musicians, drummer, keyboard, guitar, singer, they're not performing so that you can evaluate and think, wow, man, that was lacking. This is not a stage so you can think that way. This is so that you might sing and worship and read God's Word and respond to God's Word because He's the audience watching your response. He's the audience that you're giving praise to. And thank God for musicians. Right? Thank God that they prompt us and they helped us. But they are not entertainers. So, let's don't gather as consumers. First implication. Let's take that with us. Let's come back next Sunday and look at the remaining implications and look at some more ideas out of this text in Ephesians chapter 2. So my prayer is, as we leave, is that we think differently about the gathering. First, we think, number one, praise God that he would do the work in me that I would even desire to gather. Right? If God didn't do the work in you, you wouldn't desire to gather. Why would you want to come and hear somebody preach for 40, mi 40 minutes? I mean, that's foolishness to the world. But you come because God has done a work in you. Let's praise God for it. Let's worship Him rightly for it. And, and let's come as, as pupils. Let's come ready to learn and to grow and not consume like we do in every other part of our life. How different church ought to be. Amen? Now, if you find yourself separated from God because you have not come to faith in Christ, we read what you are. You're spiritually dead. You're walking according to the pattern of this world. And you are under God's wrath. And you must repent to have a right relationship with God. To be justified with God, you must repent of your sins and believe. Not intellectually, but you must believe and have your life changed. Please don't leave this morning unless you talk to me. Please. Let 
the word of God speak to the reality of your spiritual condition. And if you're lost, be saved today. Repent. Come to faith in Christ. Have your life changed so that you can rightly worship. Give praise and honor and glory to the one who deserves it. If you're saved, let's take this and leave this morning being blessed and growing in grace and knowledge. Let me pray, and then we'll sing one final song to dismiss. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, what these words mean to us as we think through them. Father, we know that we've rapidly looked at this, but Lord, we are just overwhelmed. We're a thankful Lord, we want to worship you rightly. Help us. Help us to think rightly about the gathering. And Lord, in these days ahead, these Sundays that we will come and we will gather and we will talk about what it is together. Lord, would you help us? Please help us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.